The gaps between when things happened in the past are enormous. We have to think on scales of millions of tens of millions of years. So for example, Stegosaurus was already a fossil in the ground when Tyrannosaurus rex was walking on the earth. T-Rex lived closer to us today in time than it did Stegosaurus. I think like a lot of children, I became interested in paleontology through dinosaurs. So these are animals that wouldn't look out of place sort of next to an aeroplane. Absolutely enormous. But there is a species living today that actually takes the title of the biggest animal we've ever known about, and that is the blue whale. So though dinosaurs are a lesson in how groups do go extinct, the whale is very much a current exemplar of a species that potentially faces extinction itself. So I think it's perhaps a better representation of the world we're in today. Throughout sort of the evolutionary history of life, large bodied animals have existed. And it's not limited to just the dinosaurs. There were giant sloths, three meters in height, sort of similar size as a present day elephant. There were giant kangaroos, giant wombats, penguins the same size as an adult human. One of the most interesting examples of gigantism comes from a giant snake called Titanoboa that lived about 60 million years ago in what is present day Colombia. This is an animal that approached something like 13 to 14 meters in length. I already are fairly scared of any kind of snake, so the idea of a snake twice the size of anything living today uh, fills me with dread. <laughs> So this is just the very tip of the snout of an extinct crocodile called Ramphosuchus, one of the largest crocodile relatives that ever lived about five million years ago in what is present day India. This is not the only time that crocodiles attain giant body size. Here's one additional example. Um, this animal is probably of similar size to Ramphosuchus and it's been estimated at approximately 12 meters in length, weighing something like nine tons. So for comparison, a living crocodile is only about three meters long today. And all we're really preserving here in Ramphosuchus is this sort of front half of the snout to give you some idea of how large this actual specimen really is. It's been suggested in the past that perhaps there is actually some trend towards gigantism for a group of organisms to get bigger and bigger with time. This has been termed Cope's rule or Cope's law. This is something that does happen, and there are lots of benefits to getting to large body sizes, but there are also disadvantages as well. It might surprise many people to realize that actually, dinosaurs never completely went extinct. Birds are dinosaurs. One of the clear features about birds that distinguishes them from some of the other groups that went extinct is that they're much smaller. In general, we see this pattern where smaller bodied animals tended to do better, to have a better chance of having survived the mass extinction. In contrast, large bodied animals need greater resources, but there's also nowhere for them to hide. There's nowhere for them to find shelter, and so they're much more vulnerable. One sort of way of thinking about this is a group of organisms gets larger and larger through time, a major event, say a mass extinction, like the one that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs, comes along and essentially filters out all those large-bodied animals. And this happens again and again. Regardless of whether Cope's law is a law as such, whether it's true or not, we have the more pressing problem of our own extinction. What we're experiencing today is almost unprecedented changes in our climate and our environment. And that's really the signature of many of the mass extinctions in the past, this sort of rapid change. This is really where the fossil record comes into its own. It provides us with a wonderful natural laboratory into the way that this has happened before. 
And this can be important for thinking about what we need to do to try and maintain biodiversity on the planet. The Natural History Museum has over 80 million specimens in it and there are over 200 scientists working behind the scenes to understand the diversity of life, what life is present at the moment on Earth, how that might change in the future, um, and also how it changed in the past. Understanding body mass is really, really key to help us understand loads and loads of interesting things about extinct animals. However, in order to calculate body mass, we really, really need complete skeletons. And we very rarely have those in the fossil record. So what can we do about that? We can look at closely related fossils and try to fill in the gaps based on the proportions of closely related animals. So we can look for ratios in terms of things like their length. So I could look at aspects relating to the tip of its snout through to the back of its skull here. And then compare that with, for instance, the breadth of the skull perhaps here at this point as well. And you can compare and contrast this with this other skull, then we're looking at the same thing across these different species. So this is a way we can quantify the overall anatomy of these animals. That kind of information allows us to start to understand why certain members went extinct when other ones survived. And that's kind of important for trying to understand which species might be most vulnerable to things like climate change today. The fossil record, it can give us a much clearer and broader idea of the environments that these species lived in. And that can be useful, for example, for things like rewilding programs. We can actually recognise that a species did actually used to live in these other areas and should be able to go there again. We can also use the fossil record to try and better understand what extinction should look like. Extinction is a normal process. Nearly every species that's ever lived on Earth is extinct. Although many of those did go extinct in mass extinctions, many just went extinct in what we consider as normal times. So we describe this as a normal or a background rate of extinction. If we look at over the last 500 years, over the last 100 years, what we see is that extinction rate is something like 30 times greater than that baseline level extinction. And those are conservative estimates. If anything, it's more likely to be much greater today. The fossil record is very much the key to understanding the future of biodiversity on the planet. It's our only way of seeing how species and ecosystems experience these kind of events, but the only way of seeing how they eventually bounce back. They can give us an idea of how long it takes for an ecosystem to recover. The numbers are, are truly frightening five to maybe even up to nine million years before biodiversity gets back to where it was. In an ideal world, we'd want to be able to conserve and protect every species, preserve the planet as it is. But obviously, there are limited resources. Conservationists often have to make hard decisions on which species to protect and try and conserve, and these are difficult decisions to make. If we can identify tipping points in the past associated with biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, we can use this information to try and better repair and conserve species today.